everybody, it's Rich with Kesteva. Um, and before we get into today's lesson, um, I wanted to break down what's going to be happening over the course of the next week. I'm actually doing kind of a bigger lesson this time, so it's going to be three individual videos that are about 10 minutes long, 10 to 12 minutes long each, um, going over seismic design criteria. Uh, that was actually a big topic that all of you actually recommended. Um, all different sources, people were saying, hey, you know, I really want to learn seismic design. And it's something that, you know, controls a lot of our designs over here in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. So I figured it's time to get that done. So yeah, today's episode, we're going to get into seismic design criteria using the ASCE 716. Um, at least this is for the uh, continental United States. I don't know what it is for um, other parts of the world, but um, hopefully you can follow along with your um, with your design criteria. And then we're also going to be diving into seismic vertical and horizontal distribution um, onto your structure. Um, so we're going to find our seismic design criteria and then we're going to apply that, that uh, seismic lateral forces onto our structure um, so that in the future, in future videos, we can then compare um, those lateral forces versus uh, something like uh, wind forces for lateral design and really see which one gets to govern the design of our structure. Before we start the video, please like and subscribe. Um, subscribe right down there. You know, give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. Leave comments as always. And uh, yeah, let's get going. See you in there. All right, let's go. So what we're going to be needing today is our... ASCE 716 manual, um, which is the minimum design loads and associated criteria for buildings and other structures. It's the, you know, it's kind of the grand poobah of code um, for a structural engineer for building design. And today we're going to be using chapters 1, 11, 12, and 22. Now, I do have them in PDF version, so I'm going to be walking you through them today. So you don't necessarily need your own copy with you, which is great. But if you have one, that makes it even better. It makes it maybe a little easier for you to follow along. All right, let's jump right in. So we have a building located in Longview, Washington. So that's in the continental United States on the west coast, um, located in the what's called the Pacific Northwest region. Um, I'll pop a map up for you right now, located right there, not Washington, D.C., you know, not, uh, not the greatest place ever, but Washington, the state. So that's where our structure is going to theoretically be located today. And we do have, like I said, um, it's going to be a wood frame structure. It's going to be single story. It's going to be a gable design. And the following parameters are what's needed. So you need height requirements of your structure for seismic design criteria. So we're going to have a 10-foot single-story structure, but then your gable roof is going to be 12 feet. Um, what we're going to start off with first is diving into the ASCE manual. All right, let's go. So here's chapter one. Um, this is general requirements. And the first thing we're going to need is our risk category. Now, this can be found in table 1.5-1. Let's scoot down there. All right, so here we are. I'm going to blow this up for you. Table 5.1-1. doesn't really look like a table, but here it is nonetheless. This is page uh, 4. And what we do here is we need to define what our risk category is for the type of building that we have. Um, and so we'll take a look at the different risk categories. Um, so risk category one, building and other structures that represent low risk to human life in the event of failure. So that's something, those are really, really small structures, maybe a little pergola or a gazebo or a bus shelter, um, all single story, something that if it were to fall over, most likely it wouldn't, it wouldn't result in, in, you know, loss of human life. Like they're basically just stated there. I just said it in a different way. So, um, for us, we're going to have basically a typical, say it's like a, Say it's more, say it's like a light commercial building is what we're going to be using. So it would not be risk category one. Risk category two, all buildings and other structures except 
for those listed in risk category one, three, and four. Yeah, super specific, right? So basically what they mean by that is you need to check if, if your structure falls under risk category one, three, or four, and if it doesn't, then it's by default risk category two. So risk category three, are, um, buildings and structures, the failure of which could pose a substantial risk to human life. Um, so this is light commercial. It's really, it, it wouldn't fall under that. This would be something more like assembly areas or concert halls or a movie theater, somewhere where large sums of people can, uh, can meet at one time. So that's not going to be us. And then risk category four is the, the grand poobah. That's basically, and this is a word that you should get familiar with. This is buildings and other structures designed as essential facilities. So essential facilities are in the event of a natural disaster. So a seismic event, uh, you know, we have a massive earthquake. Facilities that are required to help the general public and get over and provide disaster relief, those are classified as essential facilities. So fire stations, police stations, hospitals, um, you know, there, there's probably a couple dozen other, but those are usually the big ones. Schools fall under essential facilities. And then as you look a little further here, they talk about basically hazardous waste facilities here, anything that's holding some pretty nasty stuff. We want to make sure that, that doesn't, uh, those structures don't fail, and then we have uh, chemical spills all over the place. So that is also definitely not our building unless you got some shady activity going on inside of your light commercial building. So that means it's not category one, it's not three, and it's not four. That means we're risk category two. Risk category two. Next, we need our site class. So our site class is not actually going to be um, found in the code. Um, we are actually going to go to an external source that is an external source that is commonly used by engineers. So we're going to flip over to the internet. Now, a little shameless plug here. I use Brave Browser. Um, super awesome, super sweet. I would highly suggest you download and use it instead of the other ones. They do a really good job of uh, protecting your privacy. But yeah, that's just, uh, that's just my opinion. They don't endorse me at all or anything like that. Maybe one day. All right, so you're here in Google, and what you're going to type in is hazards.atcouncil.com. Dot org. And what this will take you to is the ATC um, website. And again, like I said, this is a website that is commonly accepted by structural engineers to use. Their data is really spot on and is updated regularly. And what you need to do is you come down to your address and we'll type in Longview, Washington. And then we're going to specify seismic. And then you have three things here. So your reference document. So we are using ASCE 716, but there's other codes here, IBC, other ASCEs, um, a few others that I'm actually not familiar with. Maybe some of you could chime in in the comments, but we are 716. Our risk co category, we already defined, is two. And now our site class. Well, our site class can, is usually defined uh, by the geotechnical engineering report, um, but what happens if you don't have one of those and you're, you're you know, designing one of these, like a commercial structure, um, per code requirements, per 716, it does say that you um, typically you have to default to site class D. So right here you have um, D default, so that's what we're going to be using. Then the site will generate some outcomes that we need. So we need to take these SS, S1 parameters and bring them back over to our problem. So site class is D by default. And then from our ATC website, um, from our report from the website, we have an SS equal to 0.898G. And we have an S1 equal to 0.436G. All right, so we have these two. And you're going to say, well, what do we need these for? Well, where I'm going with this is if we go back to the code, and now we dive into Chapter 11. Here we are at Chapter 11. So Chapter 11 in ASCE 716 is 
uh, defined as seismic design criteria, which is exactly what we're doing today. Now we're going to jump down a little further to where all the action starts and beginning gives you some uh, definitions and some general understanding of what the what this chapter goes through and what it means. Uh, I'd suggest you read that on your own time. Like I said, then we fall into definitions. Well, where we do eventually land on page 83 is section 11.4, seismic ground motion values. So for this, we're going to scroll a little further, and this is really the start of where you start to accumulate all of your seismic design criteria. So site class we got, site class D. Um, now we are responsible for finding SMS and SM1. Now notice those in those equations, they have SS and S1. Well, those we found from our um, the ATC report, and we're going to use those to find SMS and SM1. So now we need FA and FV. So let's start with let's start with SMS. So that means we need to find FA. FA can be found table 11.4-1. And all we do is we know our site class is site class D, and then our SS value is 0 0.898. So basically, our S is 0 0.9. That means we are somewhere in here. So if we shoot over and we shoot down, we're somewhere in between the two. And notice the note below, use straight line interpolation for values um, for intermediate values of SS. So we can just straight interpolate across these. So we have 0 0.9, which is closer to 1.0 than it is to 0 0.75, um, but not by much. So really, we could say, um, you know, 1.15 would be justifiable. But we need to be careful here because in the notes above, um, if we read, starting here, um, where site class D is selected as the default site class per section 11.4.3, that we have done that, the value of FA shall not be less than 1.2. All right, well, that means that this is no good, and our FA is actually equal to 1.2. So we're going to jump back. So now we know FA is equal to 1.2. Now we need FV. FV is really straightforward as well. That can be found in table 11.4-2. So this is the long period site coefficient, FV. Same thing, site class, D. And for S1, we have 0 0.436. So it's somewhere in here. 0 0.436, that gets us about 1.84. Five. It doesn't need to be absolutely spot on exact. I mean that that value is more than close enough. So, um, but if you'd like, if you'd like to do perfect interpolation, that's absolutely fine too. So 1.85. That is FV for us. So we're gonna head back. All right. And now we know from the equations. Take these. SMS is equal to. 0 0.898 times FA, which is 1.078 G. SM1 is 0 0.436 times 1.85, which is 0 0.807 G. All right, wonderful. Well, now, if we head back to the code, what's the next step? So we have both of these. We're good. Now, if we scroll a little further, now you need your design spectral acceleration parameters, which are these right here. So SDS and SD1. These are important. And they're really straightforward. SDS, as you see, just equals two-thirds of SMS, and SD1 equals two-thirds of SM1. So let's jump back. So now SDS equals two-thirds of 1.078, which gets us... 0.64 g. SD1 equals two-thirds of 0.807, which 
gets us 0.538G. Next, we need our seismic design category. And this you can find in table 11.6-1. So let's jump over. So here we are, table 11.6-1, seismic design category. And what you can see is they are using the value of SDS that we found um, to give you your risk category. So our SDS is 0 0.64, if you recall, I'll write it there. So where does that drop us? That drops us in this category. SDS is greater than 0 0.5 in the Pacific Northwest. Pretty much always is. It's very seismic. Um, it's seismic country, so earthquake country, however you want to say it. Um, so that's pretty typical for us. Now our risk category, well, did we define our risk category? We have already. We decided it was risk category 2, which is defined there. So that means whoop, we go across. Seismic design category is D. That equals D. Next, we need our seismic importance factor, which is defined as IE. We're also going to need HN and N. So HN is the structure roof peak height. Um, and this is where your ladder, your sum, the lateral forces that we are um, solving for um, are going to be applied. And per code requirement, they're applied at the mid roof of the mid height of the roof line. So for us, we do that. That is going to be HN, which mid height just means that that distance to the peak is equal to the eave which means it's just this the total height of the roof, just divided by two, which is six feet. Add that to the height of your wall. That gets us HN equals 10 feet plus six feet equals 16 feet. Wonderful. N is just the number of stories above the base. For us today, that's just one. So N equals one. Now we're back to the seismic importance factor, i.e. So this can be found in uh, table 1.5-2. So let's head over.